6.46 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, March 5th, 2022 years from something. And today I would like to probably just touch on a few things. And they, they'll probably weave together, like, uh, I think like most of, of what I do, <clears throat> weaves together. I, I think that's just the nature of who we are. I think somebody who knows a lot about the most fundamental, um, best things, let's say, most quality things about this world, can talk relatively at length about almost anything and have some decent insight on it. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, can you see this? I'm seeing this in the camera. I don't know if anybody can see this or not. This is a Zio. I'm just saying that in case you're like me. If if somebody does a video or it, I'll notice, I'll notice every detail. I can't help but do that. And if it's something, it'll distract me. And if you see this box, you know, right here, what is that? What is that? It's actually it's a Zio. Uh, it's a Zio heart monitor. They just call it a disposable because it'll come in a box, and you. Unpeel it, you stick it on. It monitors you for, well, this one's going to be a week. And then you take it off after the week, put it back in the box, send it back. You have a little log. So if anything, you know, you can write that down. But anyway, so yeah, I'm wearing it for a week because the cardiologist just thinks I love too much. And she wants to see if there's something wrong with my heart. <laughs> but anyways no it's um it's because there's there's something that these doctors who were supposed to worship something's going on that none of them can seem to figure out real you know these like high dollar kind of um highly respected doctors in a in a health system that is supposed to be a superior health system to most other health systems anywhere near. And I got to wonder about that. I know I'm interrupting myself, but I got to wonder about that because this, now this is a health system in central Michigan. And I'm thinking about the kind of people that dominate the ethnic profile up here because they're quite different than the people that dominate the ethnic profile where I come from. Okay. Where I come from in Indiana, the, Really, the dominant ethnic profile is, and yeah, when you get into like certain more urban areas, it does shift a lot. But where I grew up and, and, and a lot of Indiana, okay, is, um, German and Irish. Let me say German and Celt. I feel bad. Like I don't want to leave out other Celts because Irish is not the only Celt. So I'm sorry to say that. You know, I'm just, I'm speaking my own profile. German and Celt. And it's really funny when you start looking at demographics of certain areas and who's the, uh, the main demographic and what's available to them. You start making some, I think, very well educated judgments and conclusions about what's going on. Where I come from, the, the health systems are pretty inadequate in a lot of ways. But you get up here and the ethnic profile is extremely different and much better healthcare systems. And no, I don't actually think it's because of the demographic that they're making a far better healthcare system. No, no. Because here's the thing, you have plenty of working people in the area that I was born and raised in, that most of the people with my ethnic profile come from. You have all of the potential for money. You have plenty of brains there too, by the way, and a lot of talent. So there's really no reason for it. Why do I get in, into an area that has a, a sharply different ethnic profile than myself? And all of a sudden you have these healthcare systems that are... I don't know if I want to use the word far superior, but um, 
Hmm? Seem to serve the population in um, a far more appropriate way. Maybe that's how I should say. It. I don't know. Maybe I'm just maybe I'm just imagining things. You know, maybe I'm just fantasizing. So I got this picture on the screen here. It is of a statue, at least in the front there, a statue that has been damaged. Now I could read the caption below. I could read the words on the base of the statue there that are sticking out from it. I don't know if those are actually ap applique, if those are actually applied or if those are original to the base, and that's an interesting topic, too. But let's just talk about the statue itself, right? So I might not know, even if that word wasn't there, if I came, came along this statue and it had been defaced, there's no head on it, let's say there's the other arm isn't there, and there's no wording on it, there's nobody around to help me figure out what's going on there, and I could still look at this statue, <clears throat> and based on what I know about female anatomy, about common female dress now and yesterday, about some basic cultural symbols, I could figure out a number of things from this statue. Even though it's been defeated, there's no head on it. Maybe there's no other arm on it. I could figure out a lot of things. I could take a look at those areas where parts of it are missing. And if, if those areas, there's clear evidence of those parts being broken off, then I could say, well, then that's pretty good evidence that those parts were there, that this person who the statue was made after did indeed have two arms. So this probably is somebody with two arms. And I don't have to say it was probably someone with a head because if you're someone, you have a head. So I don't really have to say that, but I can tell you from things I'm looking at, like I can tell you it's a woman and not a man. Now, some people might say, well, what about the big dress? Well, you know, maybe it was robes. We, well, you know, you can come across a statue that's of somebody in, in all kinds of robes, and maybe it would be a little bit more difficult. But this statue has boobs. So, um, unless it was made really recently, and we're talking about some kind of guy who has really never developed his testosterone very much, or it fell off really fast, well, because of lifestyle and diet choices and whatnot. But even man boobs don't look like girl boobs. So I know that's a female. And not only by the boobs, but look at the arm. That's not a boy's arm. That's That damn well shouldn't be a boy's arm. Let's say that. I'm not going to say no boys have arms that look like that. That's a female arm. Okay? And even those hands, kind of small, kind of look like female hands. She's got fatty fingers, though. So, I mean, it doesn't look like she's worked much. And she has a stick, a scepter, something in her hand, which tells me that she probably, it's probably a symbol. A symbol meant to tell us that she rules something. I, I could just tell you a lot about that statue. I might be able to keep going, too. Because, look, she's standing on something, and if I got up close and I examined what she's standing on, I might be able to tell you a lot more about her, okay? But I'm not looking at something that's, that's heavily detailed. But what I'm saying is that statue has been defaced. It's missing a head. It could be missing an arm, yada, yada, yada. But I can still tell you a heck of a lot about it, even though it's been defaced pretty badly. doesn't have a head. Now, this one... This has been defaced literally. Um, the articulated eyes are gone. The nose is gone. It looks like the upper lip area might have been defaced, either by applying something to it or tearing something off. Depends on the lighting. I'm not too sure. It's had something it looks like, color thrown on it, so on and so forth, and has a number of abrasions. However, even though it's been 
defaced very badly. I can tell you that that is almost 100%. Maybe not. There's a possibility it could have been, could have been somebody else, but I can tell you with almost 100% certainty that that is supposed to be a bust of the guy that we call Abraham Lincoln, who is supposed to be the 16th president of the United States, the president of the United States during the Civil War, etc. Why? Well, because I pay attention to other statues and other images I've seen, and I know that hair, and I know that beard, and that jaw profile. It's, it's not hard to match them up, because I've seen so many pictures and statues of this guy they say is Abraham Lincoln, 16th President of the United States, President of the Union during the Civil War, so on and so forth. So even though the nose isn't there, even though the eyes aren't there, I can tell you it's pretty likely that's what that was in the first place. And it looks like if you look over there to the to the left, to our left as we're looking at it, it looks like that might be the mole, right? Um, oh. <clears throat> and even if it wasn't, I could still tell you things about that. That's a male. I know it's a male because of the shape of the skull. It's got a beard. So, you know, unless it's a circus freak, that's a male. Jawline, these are these are all male features. Um so even if it weren't him, we can we can at least go on the fact that it is a male. It is a male with a beard, he parts his hair on the left side, blah blah blah, so on and so forth. So that we can still tell a heck of a lot about that. One of the big reasons that we can tell a lot of these things is that we have done throughout our life. And then some people who might specialize in things like this have actually um, done a lot of really close comparison of a lot of things so that they can tell you a heck of a lot about details of a thing even though it's been defaced. And something can be radically defaced. And if you know enough about enough other things like um, other statues, other bits of art, pop culture, you can tell somebody a heck of a lot about a statue, even one that's been defaced really, really badly. And that's important. That's very important that you have spent the time looking at a lot of similar things so you understand the form, at least, and you understand a lot of the details. And you know that these details are going to show up in repetitious ways. And there's certain logical, realistic conclusions that you can draw based on that knowledge base that you have. And you see, we can repeat this with a pretty decent degree of accuracy. Again, a lot of it depending on our knowledge base. We can repeat this a lot. You know, a little child may not be able to, if they don't know what to look for, they don't have a very good knowledge base. I can look at this statue right here that apparently it's another one that may not have a head. No, I can't see its head. Maybe it does, but I can't see it from here. I can tell you a few things about it. First off, it's probably a man. Why? Based on the hand. The size of the hand, the shape of the hand. Um, it has no breasts. Okay, that's another big clue. Probably a guy. And uh, the clothing they are wearing. Again probably a guy. So we can do this over and over and over and over. Boy, here's a weird one. Well, what's this statue of? Well, not entirely sure, but whatever it is, it's probably male. Why? No boobs. Big clue. As far as what else is going on here, I don't know, but I can guess that there was probably a face there. You know, just spitballing. But there was probably a face there. Now, I'm getting around to some, and this one too, and yeah, these are kind of easy. Yeah, that's a woman. Why? Features. Features. Soft features of a woman's face. Okay, even though a lot of the face is gone, we can tell by a lot of other things that that's a woman. What is this? Well, I can't tell you whether that's a boy or a girl necessarily, but um, it definitely looks like a child because this head, even though it's gone and hollowed out, is different from this head in the sense that it's smaller.
It's smaller. And based on what I'm seeing right here, I'm thinking maybe it's a boy just by the collar and the shirt clothing that it's wearing just from this point up. Now, if there was more for me to examine, maybe I could tell you more and so on and so forth. But, you know, you get the idea. Now, if we had, let's say there was, um, let's say there was a, a marble statue of a man, man or woman, a person. And let's say that that marble statue, when it was complete and it was uh, in good shape and all, that you could tell a whole lot about that person that the statue was uh, meant to portray. But somebody or somebody's came along and they really defaced this. I mean, really bad. Let's say they knocked the head off of it. That's not good. And let's say they knocked the head off of it down to the shoulders. So we couldn't even tell by, you know, how broad the neck is or, you know, definition in the neck, whether it was male or female. And worse than that, they actually took the time to really knock away at just about every part of this statue. Say it's a nude statue. They knocked off the, the genitals. Uh, if it was a male, you know, then it'd be difficult. But if we still had the physique, that's easy. But let's say that they... They defaced the physique too. Like literally, they knocked off all of the portions on this thing where there were actually defined muscles to where all we have left is literally this form with no muscle features, the head's knocked off, and there was, the statue is actually holding something in both hands, but they, they knocked off those things too. So we don't know. But there's still some things that we could reasonably say about it. One thing we could reasonably say about it is it is the form. It is in the form of a human being. It is standing upright. It has two legs, two arms, a torso. It is very much in the form of a human being, not a great ape or anything like that, but a human being. Homo erectus. We could, we could say that. And who knows, if there was some other features that they left here and there, maybe we could say that. But if there, if nothing else, we could probably tell you that. Now, if it was in a certain posture, if the arms were in a certain posture, and we had seen a number of other statues that had the arms in those certain postures, and I mean, they were pretty distinct, one in this way and one in that way, and we had seen a number of other statues like that with arms one is this way, one is in that way, and both hands are holding something. Well, then we could say, well, this, this is probably, this was probably once just like those other statues, and it was probably portraying the same thing or sort of thing. It probably had the same symbolic nature, or it was representing the same themes as these other ones, because of simply the position that the arms are in. And we've seen so many other statues where the arms are in this certain position, they're holding these certain things, and it has this certain symbolic nature. It's just thematic. You can tell a lot, even, even about very, very defaced things, if something matches themes. And we could... We could even have a bunch of statues, like, say, across the country or across the world, all been defaced in various ways. But if there were pieces of all of these, and we knew that they were all related, let's just say by the posture, the way the hands were being held, the way they were presented, things like that, there was, there was enough evidence about all of these, like 20 of them, to know that they are probably representing the same thing. And then we examined all of them. And there were little pieces that the people who defaced them, they left little pieces in each statue. And we could start telling something. Like, one of the statues, they didn't completely remove whatever the one hand was holding. And we could sort of piece together what that should probably be just by that one piece of whatever it was it was holding they left behind. Let's say another statue had another piece in the other hand of something it was holding. And we could start piecing that together. What we would do is we would be able to 
based on all those bits and pieces of evidence spread out throughout all those various statues a pretty darn good idea of what these artists or if it was one artist and it was just reproduced was representing what the symbolism was what the theme was what they were conveying at least to a decent degree of accuracy and certainly enough to where <clears throat> if someone came along and said they looked at it they looked this thing it's you know it's extremely defaced but there's still that form left if somebody came along and took a look at that and said uh yeah no i i think that's a giraffe that you could turn to them and you can say yeah um why why would you say it's a giraffe well, because we clearly don't know what this is. It's been defaced pretty bad. Um, yeah, true. It, it's been defaced pretty bad. However, you will notice that even though we can't tell if it's male or female, and we can't tell a lot of about what it was symbolizing because the things that used to be in the hands, they're gone, the head's gone, things like that. That's true. Um, however, the form of it is unmistakably human. For it to be a giraffe, it, it really can't have those arms you see like that. That's, that's not going to happen. It's not going to look like that. Even if it was a giraffe like rearing up, it's not going to look like that. Because giraffes have a different bone structure and skeletal structure, the way their anatomy is made and everything. I'm sorry, but it's not a giraffe. Like There's other details that we could speculate on, sure. But that's totally not a giraffe. That's pretty clearly the form of a human. <clears throat> so now there's the matter of themes. and fooling around with themes. How you can fool around with themes. And it's a great, it, it, it's a great, I forgot the word. <laughs> Starts with an I. <clears throat> illustration. It's a great illustration actually of the way the Bible can be manipulated because it has been, because another language has been put up top the original language. In fact, a number of things have been changed. Um, the look of the letter has been changed. The Masora that's applied to it changes a lot about the what we perceive. For anyone who hasn't listened to some of, just say, my more recent word studies, from like the Obery hours, um, which I'm going to actually be re-releasing those pretty soon because I can't monetize them because I've got that, that song, that intro song from um, television on there. It's a great song. But uh, anyways, even like episodes, what, 7, 8, 9? And I think actually 12 and 13, which cover directions, because I go through so many passages and I show you the problem with seeing certain wording in a certain way and how inconsistent it is. However, I wouldn't be able to do that whatsoever if all of those words were wrong. Like if I wasn't able to understand anything about any of these passages. But I am. And the reason is this. Even though you have a lot of manipulation, you still have a certain degree of consistency that has to be there, or else it all becomes either incoherent or it's just not manageable. Like, it just sticks out way, way, way too obviously. If you take common words, 
There's some common words. Um, common words like um, al. So that would be if you have two things and you are uh, communicating a spatial relationship between the two, you would use al to let someone know that the one thing is going towards the other. And it's commonly translated as, as to, unto, that sort of thing. Or ol. Now, ol is sometimes translated as over, sometimes it's translated against, uh, and in various other ways, but it does, again, indicate a spatial relationship between two things, and there's only so much play. There's only so much play. And it's one of those words that sticks out like a sore thumb when you start fooling with it, and I'll get to that. I'll come back around. You take a word like ammer which is to speak. They translate it a few different ways, but you always know that what we're getting is that one party is communicating in some way to another party when you see Ammer. We know that because it's used so many times in so many contexts. That even if they manipulate it a little bit, like, for instance, the word Deber. Deber is also used, and very frequently it's translated as speak or say. But it's so frequently translated as things like matter or a subject or something like that, that there is very strong reason to conclude that it doesn't necessarily mean the, the act of verbalizing something one party to another like Ammer does. And the fact that it will appear in the same verse with Ammer and there's no reason for it being there if it if it's literally just to say or to speak just like Ammer is. There's a lot we can conclude even though even though so many bad things have been done to the text. And I want to really go over this because there's a lot of people when they, they come to understand that I've made a very good case for how and why the Bible has been fooled with. And I've made a good case that it's not been fooled with like, oops, on accident, but it's deliberate. I think a lot of people get, I think a lot of people get forlorn and disheartened as though and I don't think this is unnatural. I think this is just, it's a natural but knee-jerk response to say, then how can we know? How can we know for sure? If they could change these things, how do we know what any of this says? How do you know that the things that you're saying, if you're trying to prove different things, let's say in portions of um, a presentation I did like bringing it together, I argue that the whole covenant concerning blessing or cursing has to do with the keeping of law or not keeping of the law, and it is with the tribes of Israel alone. And it has to do mainly with living in the land they were given perpetually and enjoying a certain amount of blessings. Now, that doesn't mean that nobody else in the world is also obligated to keep these basic sets of laws because they actually are and that's why a number of prophets prophesy to other nations that are not Israelites. The relationship that Yahweh has with Israel doesn't mean that he doesn't care about other people either. It means that he has a particular relationship with Israel and Judah, Israel, and that there are specifics. And so I use a number of passages, and I tend to use passages that are available in current translations, not because I think they're superior, but because if anyone wants to check my work, if they want to go back and see, okay, are these themes represented in these places in the way he says, then I want there to be an available translation. And I typically want to use the same translation throughout any presentation I'm making, and I try to do that. The only two translations that I'll commonly use is either KJV because of its coding to Strong's and how easy it is to search through typically, or World English Bible. And World English Bible, because for one thing, just like the King James, by the way, 
The King James and the, and the World English Bible don't have a specific uh, copyright. There's no, you can use it without somebody coming along and saying, but that's our intellectual property. You understand? Neither one of them have that on there. And the World English Bible is far more contemporary. And in a lot of ways, they do have a bit better, in some ways, translations. But I'll try to always stick with either one, typically one, or I might phase between the two, maybe, maybe. And then sometimes, if the translation's so bad, I will provide um, one degree or another of an Obery translation, typically explaining why I had to give another translation. Sometimes not, but I will definitely let you know that this is my own translation or an Obery project translation. This is all important because anybody needs to be able to check my work, verify it or criticize it if it's not done very well. Um, <clears throat> but you need to understand something. If somebody's watching a, a presentation or they're listening to me speak on a subject or subjects, and I start talking about all of the problems inherent in the translations of the Bible and why. And it all has to do with this Mazora and the changes and who did it and why they did it and so on and so forth. I've seen this happen so many times now that people will say, then how can we know what anything says? How can we argue a case? And it's perfectly natural to think that. Because when I started discovering these things, I thought that too. Now, I tried to do a, a pretty good job of explaining how we can actually use patterns of recognition as well as uh, doing some good diligent searching into Gothic language, uh, Old German, even modern German, English, Celt, and there's various manifestations of these languages too. We do have to be aware of that. They have been mixed with other languages, but we can look at those things. We can compare roots. Um, we need to do a lot of diligent searching in the Bible, get to know the language as, as well as we can, and then start doing um, types of searches that actually match up specific words and specific phrases and specific passages and seeing what about them we can count on as being consistent, like reflecting a theme through their consistency or not. So here's the big difference. Words can be changed. So I illustrated this, for instance, in the, uh, the Obrey Hours I did on Adame. Words can be changed. And sometimes, if it's a particular noun, and you only have to tweak little things here and there about the verses or the context, just little things, you can get away with changing something that was supposed to be one thing for another. And you can hide something by doing that. Now, of course, you do have to do a number of other things. You do have to change certain other very important words around it. But one of the things that's actually much harder to do is to entirely change a theme, especially a theme that is a running theme. That's really tough to do because you have to change so much in order to change that theme that it would, in my opinion, oftentimes become untenable. And I would think whoever has manipulated the Bible, they understood this. And I think a lot of the decisions that they made, and I do think they had some time to do this and develop it while we were in our captivity and in our slavery and we didn't have a lot of interaction with literature and with the scriptures anymore for some time. They've had a long time to do this. And they've really, they've done it right under our noses for at least a century, two centuries, you know. 
And there's there's ways and means that they've had to do this. But they realized this. And, you know, this was certainly not something that was done, um, you know, by, by random cowboys here or there. This, this was definitely a concerted effort. And they probably literally had meetings on these things and developed it in a more um, precise way. And that's one of the interesting things about having the Septuagint is because you can see a you can see a deviation in an older form and using a different language to do it. So therefore it is very important. Again, it's not a reason to throw one's hands up and say, well, what can we understand? We can understand themes because they can't entirely change themes without changing a whole heck of a lot around those themes. I'm not saying there's no themes in the Bible that they were able to change, but I am saying in order to change a theme because of how often the same themes are repeated over and over and over and over throughout the law and the prophets and the writings, it would become so utterly burdensome to entirely change a theme. And maybe they changed a couple. And maybe that's why there are so many uh, wording problems. But I can tell you that they could not change many and still keep any kind of coherency. And then you have to figure, what themes did they decide were the most important to change? Because they had to decide, okay, well, some of these things, they're probably not that important for us to change. Because if we just change people's perception about who these people are, we don't really have to change these themes as far as uh, the deal that was made with them so much, or maybe uh, we don't really have to change so much, um, you know, the consequences, things like that. Those, I, those can probably stay the same because if we just change people's perception on who the subject is, a lot of these others we don't really have to deal with. The most we have to deal with is the fact that we have to keep language and the words that we've changed relatively consistent whenever they come up again throughout all of these passages, and thus you run into how one word might have a dozen different ways that it's translated. Because that's just going to happen. You're going to run into that. But the way that, for instance, there is the theme that starts in the law, as reiterated to Israel. I don't think it actually started in the law, but as reiterated to Israel, because Israel had one tribe that were appointed to do uh, certain specific tasks that were for Yahweh and the keeping of the law and the keeping of records and making of judgments and things like that. And so because there was this one tribe, they actually had to be supported in certain ways by the other 12 or 11, because remember, Joseph gets double portion. So two of his sons were present, Manasseh and Ephraim. Okay, they were representing Joseph, but they were both tribes. The other 12 tribes. And in return, and we are talking about the Luim or Levites, they were not allowed to possess land in inheritance like all of the other tribes were and to grow wealthy through those pursuits and exploits. So there was a checks and balances. But some of the language we'll see in there, for instance, we could be looking at passages that happen over and over and over and over again when, when we're looking at offerings brought. We're looking at offerings brought. In different ways, some offerings were expected as a percentage of one's increase what they call the tithe. Others were expected based on gifting. And most oftentimes you would see these things brought to Yahweh. But they were oftentimes given to and used by the Luim either for them, themselves or oftentimes to be given out to others who didn't have it, who were in need, and so on and so forth. But the one weird thing you'll notice is this. So that theme of people either by obligation or by free will. 
are bringing various items to the Luim, the Levites, because that was their position, their place, their job, their role. They'd bring them to them because they occupied, for one thing, the places, the facilities where things would be processed, stored, handed out, used by them, so on and so forth. When they would bring these things, there is one term that if we find it outside of the context, outside of these themes, we know that it's always denoting something over or against that sort of relationship. But then when we see it in the context of the Luim, Levites, all of a sudden it turns into a burnt offering. And I personally don't know how useful something is when it's been burnt away. Well, first off, you know how hard it is to burn organic matter, a body? I do. Burning a body, and not from reading, from experience. I know how hard it is to burn a thing that was just alive. It's really really difficult and you because there's so much water in something that was just alive i mean a lot there's a lot of liquid it's really hard to do it requires a lot of fuel now i'm not saying that when that word ol or ole is used that's, yes, that's where they get that hollow word. Yes, because it's just transliterated into Latin. Okay. I'm not saying when that word is used that that definitely doesn't mean burnt offering just because it would take so much stinking fuel and time, which it would. Long time. My goodness, the organs of something that was just alive to burn them, unbelievable. The hair takes a while. The skin takes a while. You know, the organs, they take time, and some organs, it, it nearly impossible. You would have to keep working on them, working on them, working on them. That's how difficult it is. And this is one of the tools that we apply, just like with the statues. One of the tools we apply is what we just, what we know about the world. What we know about the way things work. Well, we should apply that when we go and we try to understand what the Bible in fact says to try to understand why they changed the things that they did. And when we look at something that's thematic, like bringing offerings to the Luim, bringing offerings to the Luim, and we see this word sticking out like a sore thumb, ol and ole, and we see them constantly they translating it as burnt offering. When we know that ol simply, just simply means over or against. Sometimes it can mean, if you see it like ma'ole, it would seem like we're talking about something that is at an incline. But there's nothing about the word that indicates that it has to be a burnt offering. And some would say, well, just ole itself, meaning going up. But that doesn't mean it's being burnt. Yeah, I know smoke rises. But again, that alone does not mean that we're looking at something that's being burnt. Not enough information. And when we see that most of the time when all and ole are used, it tends to mean over, up, up against. And they can change that because it's one component. <laughs> It is one component of a theme. That theme is repeated so many times that it would be very, very difficult to change the theme. But it's not very hard to change something like ol, which normally would be over or against, into burnt offering, a sacrifice. That's much easier to do. Simply, for instance, 
if you offer something up, all that really needs to mean is that you have relinquished your claim and control on something, offered it up to Yahweh in the form of giving it to those that he has deemed are representatives to do work that he has deemed they should do in a certain way, and they are bound to rules too. Giving this thing unto them is an offering up or giving unto them, putting it against them, all. And it is far more reasonable to think that than that all or ole is referring to something being burnt. But if they went back and tried to change the theme of bringing certain various things, either by obligation or free will, to the Luim, that would be very, very difficult because they would have to change so many words. This is the way they can get away with doing things. And I know talking about ole, as in the burnt offering, compared to just offering up. If I give a chunk of my money to either somebody who's just in need and they're not a person who I think will squander it. They, they're not in need because they're a degenerate and they blow their money anyways. There's somebody who genuinely, they're in need. They're a widow. They're an orphan. They are amongst the people who Yahweh tells me in the Bible to help. I'm giving that money. In a sense, I am offering it up. Even not a sense. Yeah, I am. Why? Because he told me I should do this. I'm offering it up. I may give it directly to them. Sure, that does not change the fact that I am offering it up. So the term ol and ole, absolutely appropriate. I'm not burning that money. Now, I'm telling you this and using this example because, for one thing, I don't want a lot of people that run into the work that I've done concerning um, the problems with the language, with the text, with so-called Hebrew, which is indeed obery. And how it's been manipulated and changed and think and think all hope is lost. To understand themes, you know, all hope is it's not. And we can very confidently understand a lot of themes that are within the Bible. For one thing, because the theme, and oftentimes themes are something that have to be communicated over a number of verses. And then themes are oftentimes repeated multiple times in either a book of the law, book of the prophets, one of the writings. Themes, ideas are repeated so many times for a good, very good reason. I, obviously, I think Yahweh inspired these books and that he repeated those themes for a very good reason. In fact, if we find books within the context of all of that that don't have those repeated themes, that actually introduce new themes or ones that we're not familiar with from the witness of so many other books that are just repeating those themes over and over and over again and reinforcing them, then we should be kind of concerned. But if somebody's talking about a theme that's just so intrinsic, repeated, again and again and again and again and again and again. Then it's very reasonable for someone to say, well, there, I think there is, there is something to this. Because it's very difficult to alter a theme. Not that hard to alter words. Singular words within a theme. Let's go play baseball. Let's go play basketball. 
They're two totally different games. But I can change that word around. But it's harder for me to change the theme around. Let's go eat baseball. Okay, let's go eat basketball. That doesn't work so good. I'm going to have to change a lot more to make that work. I'm going to have to change a lot of words. And I'm going to have to do it in a lot of places. Because that same theme shows up over and over and over and over and over. So, I'll cut this off here. But, um, that's all this was. It's just an illustration of how, yeah, there's a lot of problems with the wording. There really is. But you can still be pretty confident that you can pick up on the themes if you do your due diligence and you read the Bible and you keep track of where these themes are showing up and how often they're showing up and how consistent the terminology used in them is, hey, do I have justification for believing that this theme that I'm seeing over and over and over again is indeed pretty close to accurate. And then I'm going to test that also by what I understand about nature and reality and the world and other things. Doesn't happen easy. It really doesn't. And it doesn't happen just by intuition. It takes a lot of work. It really does. Um, And if one is not willing to put the work in, you, you really are, you really are at the mercy of someone like me or somebody else, God forbid, because I don't trust many to any other people out there talking about these things. And I've got a lot of very good reasons for that. But you are. Either way, whether I sit here and tell you, you know, my, <laughs> My intentions are actually very, very noble. Well, how do you know? I would hope you would know from the consistency. First off, their consistency of theme over a long period of time that you've been able to see with me. But you really need to do everything you can to put that kind of work in yourself. If you get far enough and you understand that there is a big difference between what somebody like me is trying to do and what a lot of other people are trying to do and you believe in that, then support me too. And I mean, that's not really the point of this, but it is a point and it's real. For somebody to do work like this full time, they need to be able to pay their bills. That's just reality. But that's just a footnote at the end there. So... Either way, um, hopefully this has helped to clarify. I really do hope so. Honestly, I do. Because not all, all is not lost. And there's no reason that if somebody would, would come along and try to tell you, well, based on what he's saying, everything's up for grabs. Not true. Not true. Not true. We still have a lot of tools that a responsible, um, diligent workman can use to figure these things out. It's not going to happen fast. It's going to take a long time, especially if very few hands are doing it. But all is not lost. It's doable. And especially, look, one thing we'll know is if, if it's Yahweh's will, He's going to have it accomplished. And the way he's going to have it accomplished um, is that reason to sit back and say, well, I mean, if he's going to accomplish it, what do I got to do? No. No, sure isn't. Because he does respect us. Respect. He does expect us to be responsible, to be conscientious, and to do something. He expects, and that's a theme that you can see throughout the Bible, he puts an, a responsibility and a burden on his people and on everybody, to one degree or another. 
Everybody has a responsibility. Nobody gets to just float through life like a child. Not in his reality, no. If you're going to float through life like a child, somebody's going to come along, they're going to play the parent, and they're not going to be him. And then you're going to serve them. That's the way it goes. That's how the world is. Fact. Anyways, I'm going to, I'm going to try to cut this off before an hour. Because it's supposed to be brief. So, uh, see you guys next time.